Welcome back, Crusaders. This is the Nerd Crusade Podcast, Episode 3. We're going to talk about everything from movies to games. Uh, I'm your host, Ian, and today with me is Courtney, and we're going to be talking about some movies, the Summer uh, Game Showcase that went on last week, and uh, one of the new games that we've been playing. Um, so, let's jump right into it. One of the first movies we're going to be talking about is called The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, starring Nick Cage and Pedro Pascal. Um... Pretty much a great movie for fans. If you're a fan of Nick Cage, if you're not oh, a fan, of yeah. Nick if Cage, you're not a fan of Nick Cage, you will not like this movie. As one of our friends who we forced to watch this movie with us uh, truly demonstrated by being on their phone the entire time. Yeah, she's not a Nick Cage fan, but our friend who was <laughs> loved it. Um, it's definitely a movie that, that when you watch it, it doesn't seem like it would work, but it, it works because it is Nick Cage, and that's even more so if you've heard of like some of the stories told about Nick Cage by other people in Hollywood. Um, where like he's literally a crazy. crazy. He's such a crazy dude. Uh, he does weird things. Uh, seems like he really thinks only about himself sometimes. Um, like he will just put on a performance at a drop of a hat, and it's not the performance you're expecting. It's an out there performance. Yeah, I think um, in Seth Rogen's book, he tells a story about like how. They're looking at Nick Cage to be the villain in Green Lantern. Green Lantern, and he wanted to do like. Well, no, a, was it Green Lantern? Yeah, it was Green Lantern. No, no, it was the Green Hornets. Or Green Hornet. That's what it was. Yeah, not Green Lantern. Green Hornet. And he wanted to do like Nick Cage had an idea of doing like a white Jamaican bohemian dude, and they ended up going with Christopher Waltz, which was a much better choice, obviously. Um, but then like. James Franco did some really shitty movie like a few years later where he was like this white Jamaican dude. And Seth Rogen says like Nicholas Cage called him up and wanted to set a meeting with him for talk about a movie or whatnot idea that he had. But all it was was to ask him out to see to see if James Franco stole his bohemian like white Jamaican character. And then after he told him, like no he didn't, he made he based on something else, like Nick Cage like said, Okay, cool, I gotta go and left. And, like ended the meeting right then and there. Oh. Guy's fucking weird. Yeah. Like, literally crazy. <laughs> but if you like Nick Cage films and you have heard about the real Nick Cage, I think you will enjoy this film. And Pedro Pascal in this is just a darling. He acts like every fangirl that's ever met their idol. And just the his little expressions and his mannerisms when he was around Nick Cage is just so spot on. I love Pedro Pascal in this. He's just an adorable little puppy dog. Ooh. Yeah, and, the, and we won't get into too much because we won't spoil the movie. But the basic plot is that Nick Cage is very much being Nick Cage in Hollywood. Um, really into his career and all that type of stuff, but it's not doing too well. Turns out he's focused so much on his career. His, his family's falling apart to where he has to take a gig where a gig for a million dollars to basically go to a birthday party uh, for a Spanish millionaire. For, yeah. For or a billionaire. Who's Peter Pascal. Who's like just a huge fan of his. And then it just one crazy thing happens after another. That's like, what the fuck is going on? And everything comes back full circle. Yeah. It's, it's pretty damn good. It, it the, gets meta too, but in a good way. Yeah, it does. It goes really well. And they're, both their performances are great. Again, this is like you have to be someone who's a fan of like Nick Cage movies. Um, I'd say one of the weird, one of the only weird things in it is that they do have this. It's it's both cool but also odd, right? So like he has an inner monologue where oh, he basically Nick- yeah he's, t- he's talking to a younger version of himself. Uh, who the younger version is basically like the devil on his shoulder who's like he's a movie star and needs to act like a movie star but like they did this weird thing where I believe he's doing he's acting in both roles but they like deep they, faked his face to make him look yeah, younger yeah only aged his face so you look at Nikki's hands and it's current oh current Nick Cage hands <laughs> Nick Cage hands so it's old man hands with a new face it's kind of funny but these like crazy inner dialogues that he has with this Nikki character is cra- is hilarious I kind of wish they had a little bit more because you kind of forget about it yeah. midway through the movie. And then it's like, oh, yeah, he has this inner monologue stuff within himself. We need to add that back in. So definitely a fun movie. Um, no longer in theaters, which makes sense. It had probably a short run because it's very much for a niche audience. But if you were a fan of like 
classic Nicky Cage stuff with like Face Off or The Rock, or you like this new Con stuff Air. like Mandy, Con, or yeah, classic stuff like Con Air. But you like the new stuff like Mandy, um, the what Willie's Wonderland, yeah, and like some of the other uh, crazy independent movies that he's been doing, which he's great in those. You'll you'll really like this one. Like it has lots of callbacks to his old films. Um, it's mostly his old films that are called back. Nothing new. Well, I mean, like they had the chain. He had the chainsaw from Mandy in his like collection of his Nick Cage shrine. But they don't really like mention a lot. They and they have like well, there's a lot of stuff in there that that if you watch it again, you'll catch more and more stuff that's in this like one scene where he has the his his Pedro Pascal has his Nick Cage collection. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a very entertaining and fun movie to watch if you're a fan. If you're not. Or, you know, it's not gonna like do anything for you. If, if for especially for someone who may not even know who Nick Cage is, they're not gonna get it. No, <laughs> but definitely a fun, fun movie, and uh, I would recommend it. And where can you find it? Uh, it's on all the digital platforms. So okay. uh, any digital platform you can find it on, and then I'm sure you can find it on Blu-ray, uh, and DVD at local stores. It's called The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. Um, should have just a big picture of Nick Cage and like a. <laughs> In like and a, a tiny Pedro Pascal. Yeah. Um, but it's a great movie. Definitely recommend it. Uh, super fun. Uh, if you're not too sure, just rent it for like five bucks or something. But you should get some good laughs out of it if you like Nick Cage stuff. Yes. Um, other big movie that came out recently is Jurassic World Dominion. Do we have a review of it on our webpage already? But that review mainly looks into like the whole franchise as a whole, like the Jurassic Park franchise versus the Jurassic World franchise. From night, what is it, nineteen ninety one to now? Yeah, basically, like what's the difference between the the differences and similarities between the two franchises? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, f for this, we're just going to talk strictly about Dominion. Okay. Which um, it's kind of interesting how they tie everything back to the original Jurassic Park, not just with Sam Neill and Laura Dern, but like the main, I guess, villain is the Doc Dodgson guy that's in the beginning of of Jurassic Park who's trying to get uh Needly to steal the embryos. Yeah. That's the who the tech billionaire is in this movie. They don't really make it very obvious at first, but towards the end of it, you see him like packing up his shit and, and he packs up the uh the shaving can. cream can. Yeah. Uh and then I went back and looked at the original scene say, Oh yeah, Dodson, this guy's name is Dodson, so this is the same guy trying to steal the the, the tech. But overall what did you think of that movie? Because this is your, your type of thing. Yeah, it is my type of thing. I love big monster movies, and Jurassic Park falls into that. It's really dumb, but in a fun popcorn matinee type dumb. It's Visuals are good to see on screen. Sound design's great. But the story is a huge mess and goes everywhere. But at least all their little side stories eventually come, <clears throat> excuse me, come back and, you know, tie up all together at the end. So you don't really have any loose threads. Uh, well, yeah. I'd say like how the original Jack's Park movies or all other movies, like originally it's like, Hey, there's dinosaurs and now there's people throwing the mix. There's people trying to survive these wild animals, right? Mm -hmm. To a point where, like, now we're at the point where it's like, how do we get, how do we create a situation where these dinosaurs will have to fight? And yeah, that's show. the whole thing. Is like, how are we going to get a big dino fight? Because the last few films, that's all we led up to is like a big dino fight. And yeah, they had to throw in a big dino fight at the very end climax just because they had to and it didn't make any sense on why the humans were there they there, could... yeah the humans had to be there so <laughs> you could you could have a reason to film it basically yeah and i think it's that's so like stupid. what Jurassic world's been it's just been giant dino fight after giant dino fight for every movie in there but this is like even more stupid situations such as like an underground market where some carnivorous dinosaurs get loose and everybody's still hanging out there like no i'd Dinosaurs lose, you leave. Yeah, you book it the fuck out. And also, like, you know, all the end of the last film, all the dinosaurs were loose. Those fuckers, at least in the United States, would be wiped the fuck out because they are not part of the natural ecosystem. Look at the murder hornets up here in the Pacific Northwest. 
We are trying to wipe those fuckers out. You think we would let a couple of dinosaurs roam around and live? Hell no. They would either capture them and put them like on display or dissect them or they murder them. They would not be roaming around, running around like they are in this film. And I think in the second film they had the, the velociraptors that were like laser guided, right? I think so. Like they, they weaponized right. them somehow, but it was really oh. stupid and never really explained how they make sure they're, they're under control. <laughs> Dress for Jurassic World. I think they were mentioned. It, well, that one idiot lasers. that's played that's by the guy who plays uh, Kingpin in the MCU. Oh yeah, he, his whole thing was, "We're going to weaponize these dinosaurs." It's like nobody right. weaponizes wild animals, dude. They're not domesticated. Like, it's not a dog. This isn't your little Fido sitting next to you that you could train with a little chew toy. It's like. Yeah, I think, I think you're like, oh, with the Romans, just like, yeah, but the Romans didn't didn't do it all the time, and the kids, you can't keep them under control. Yeah. Which is such a stupid subplot in the first movie, but like, it seems like to keep going with all the other movies that, oh, somebody's trying to figure out how to weaponize just velociraptors, and that's it. To where at a point you have laser-guided velociraptors, which is really fucking stupid and makes no sense how that works. That once you put paint a laser on somebody, they'll only want to kill that one target. Which makes zero sense. <laughs> but they did that just so you can have a raptor chase in the middle of a city yeah for and no apparent reason the raptors not get distracted and go oh i guess i'm going to go after the mother and child that's just sitting at the cafe over here yeah it was, so Again, it was like sequence to sequence of how do we have how how we make this sequence happen and it really <laughs> is a, a terrible story and also what's weird is like bd wong's character mm. goes through such a huge arc because like he's in all the movies at least not oh no, it's not the, the all the Jurassic Park movies. He's in the mm-hmm. first one. I think he sh- he doesn't show back up until Jurassic this World. World is the first time you see him. But again. like he literally goes to like young scientists making breakthrough stuff with creating dinosaurs to being mad Frankenstein scientists making monster dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> to not giving to like selling them, not giving a shit about it. To oh, I need to make everything right now. I need to cure diseases and, and fix my wrongs. It's like what the fuck? This character went like through such a weird arc, and he's not even any of the main characters. Yeah, it's like, can we have like his story? Maybe he would be more fascinating. Yeah, and then them bringing back like Sam Neill, Lord Dern. It's like it's it. I put it, it was just like the original uh, Jurassic World three or Jurassic Park three, where like. These two didn't jump on for the sequel because it seemed kind of meh, but they jump on for, like, the even stupider story. Yeah. Like, this is, again, like, Jurassic Park 3, it's, like, it's even dumber than the, than than the, the second one. <laughs> Which the second one was, we thought, was bad, and then we saw this, and we're like, oh, no, it just got worse. Yeah, and it's like, why did you guys sign on for this, of all things? Um, Jurassic World would have made more sense to sign on, where, like, uh, Jeff Goldblum's been in... Almost all of them, except for Jurassic he had, Park 3. Yeah, he wasn't in 3. But he was in 1, 2, and then he was in World, and then he was in uh, World 2, and the, and this one. Yeah. And the whole reason... like, little blip cameos in those. Yeah, and then, like, the whole reason with Sam Neill's back doesn't really make sense, because it's like... Yeah. They want to prove that this lab is creating dinosaur locust which is destroying everything which is pretty obvious yeah it's like made it cause, well. <laughs> because the locusts don't eat the crops from that are from the seeds that this company makes so it's pretty obvious who made them but like she needs sam neil to be a witness it's like just no. steal the camera footage that's all you need yeah like the, the park the didn't inside make... man could have easily done that yeah he could have like oh here's footage release it out onto reddit or whatever and that would have been that. And, but no, it's like, oh, we have to somehow get all these people on this uh, enclosed park area that's the, where they protect dinosaurs. Yeah, we have to get the old cast and the new cast all together. And it's like, it really doesn't make any sense for what they're trying to do. Because also the concept is like, oh, there's dinosaur locusts around now. Like, how did that happen? It's like, the park didn't make locusts. Yeah. It's I like, mean, there's no goes- reason to put giant locusts in a dinosaur park to be observed nobody cared about that right they're in the sec the first movie they're trying to make brand new dinosaurs because everybody's bored of like the docile ones yeah so it was really it's really weird that that's like how they rope him back in um all to kind of like just have these like trailer moments where we have oh here's a picture of the whole of all the, the cast together here's a here's your dinosaur fight here's this fight and like 
the logic of what they do just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, they had this really weird scene too, where like the head CEO is meeting uh, Sam Neill and Laura Dern's characters for the first time because they're invited to their facility, oh, no. and it's supposed to be kind of, I guess, a jab at like tech CEOs, but he acts like like an animal. He goes up to his sister, "Hey, you have any food? You have any of my bars for me?" Like he's looking for a treat. Like, it was really weird. Like, even the guy's whole mannerism was as if he had Asperger's. Like, they're trying to make fun of Elon Musk and, like, Steve Jobs at the same time. It just seems really odd. It didn't really work odd. at all. It was really uncomfortable and just an awkward scene. Yeah. But, like, as I said in the, in the review on the website, it's that it's basically a, a fun, like, popcorn movie. But it's definitely not... It does have the wonder that, like, Jurassic Park had and the Jurassic World kind of had. Um, it's... On the, for me, it's on the same level as Jurassic Park 3, which is like, meh, you don't really need to watch it. Yeah. I mean, Jurassic Park 3 had a, to- had a talking vel- velociraptor in it. <laughs> this is almost as bad. Yeah. Luckily, none of the dinosaurs talk, so we're safe there. Definitely. Um. So that basically kind of covers the main movies. So I would definitely, mm-hmm. definitely say, hey, go watch uh, Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. And... And that one's only an hour and a half. Yeah, and if you're really into the Jurassic Park franchise, go ahead and check that out. But otherwise... See it as a matinee or drive through Or just rent it. Or rent it when it comes out. Um, now into the world of video games. We had some big news last week uh, that concluded last week. It was kind of the week before and going to about mid last week, which was the Summer Game Fest. And the big thing was the Xbox and Bethesda uh, showcase. Um, everyone else, like... I think Sony had a little had like a state of play thing right before it. Yeah, they Nintendo had a had forty five minute one. I watched. I think Nintendo might have had like might have had a, had a direct or something going on, but like Capcom and a few other companies um, did do showcases of their own. But the basic we're going to talk about is the Xbox Bethesda stuff because like kind of the, one of the nice things about their show, which is the first ever for like any type of E three or game show. Is that their big thing was, hey, everything we're showing you today is coming out in the next 12 months. Which is nice, because in the past, E3 has always been, hey, look at this game that we're just putting into development now. And seven years from now, you'll be able to play it, because it's not anywhere near being ready. Yeah. Like, or 12 years. I, yeah, I'm kind of sick of getting told about games that are coming out that it's not going to be out until even the next generation console comes out. If that. Yeah, if that. Which also makes it like... Well, is it going to be any good? Because if it comes out at the beginning of the console run, that means they spend most of the time building on old hardware and then last minute switched all over to new hardware to try and get it out for a new console, mm-hmm. um, which is never, never great. Um, but they had a good selection of games coming out. A lot of them is what we knew about. Um, but also a lot of it's not um, things that I think are really crazy to talk about. So like... In 2022, unfortunately, a lot of the games are coming out not till the fall, but they have... Or at the very end of the year. But I would say, like, kind of the biggest news there is um, Call of Duty comes out every year, so I don't really think that that's that great. Gotham Knights is coming out, but what we've seen there has been kind of meh. Mm-hmm. Um, Scorn finally has a release date, but Scorn also looks like a game where it might be all substance and no... Or all style and no substance, where basically there's not going to be... A decent story and it was just all about the environmental look of the hr geiger style. yeah um i think the biggest title that at least i'm excited to get to get my hands on would be persona 5 royale finally coming to the xbox it was game of the year in 2017 mm-hmm. and it's a really good game so they bring the whole persona franchise over to xbox but Persona 5 will be coming out this year where the PSP Persona 3 for portable game was coming out next year in 2023 and then Persona 4 Golden which is a which was the PlayStation like I guess remake or re, minor remaster of Persona 4 in 2023. Mm-hmm. Um if you're a big Persona fan then like yeah you probably want to play 3 and 4. I was never really big in Persona but I did play a little bit of 5 and I do like 5 quite a bit. Um, I'm not interested at all in playing a, a high def remaster of a PSP portable game. Yeah. Because whenever they take like a title from a mobile platform and put it to the bigger ones, it just doesn't look great because it's not. It wasn't made for, and they don't remaster it fully. 
Um, Valheim was a game that came out on PC, I think, almost two years ago that people were really talking about back then. It's finally coming to Xbox. Yeah. Not don't really care about that. Overwatch 2 doesn't feel like anybody cares about that because it just looks like it's more the same. Yeah, it just looks like Overwatch again. And nothing's changed. There's no storyline. Just a couple new maps. So it just might as well be an expansion. Yeah, supposedly there's supposed to be a <clears throat> a story, a, a, story, a campaign see. mode with Overwatch. At least when they originally said like, well, Overwatch has had like this weird thing. Like when they first announced, it's like, hey, if you own Overwatch One, you'll get Overwatch Two campaign for free, and then you just have to pay for the multiplayer for Overwatch Two, which is gonna be the same as Overwatch One, just different maps and maybe a couple new characters. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like that doesn't make any sense, and now it's like no Overwatch Two; it's its own separate game. Does it still have a campaign? I don't know. They didn't say anything about campaign yeah. here. They just talked about hey, Overwatch Two is coming. Um. So I think like that game has its fans, but other than that, meh. Everything else is really stuff that we've already know is coming out, like uh, Requiem's Tale. Um, and you mean now, a Plague Tale? A Plague Tale Requiem was one that they announced a couple years ago. As Dusk Falls is coming out as well. It looks like an interesting uh, art style, like story. It's a very interesting, game. like comic story. It yeah. seems so. Well, like, interested to see like how that plays out and it's also going to be on game pass too so if you have game pass you can check it out yeah that is the thing a lot of the stuff that they announced the majority of it is all going to be game pass um but stuff like grounded is it's not grounded's been out but it's been in preview yeah so like i first played when it first came out and they had very very little content like i literally got to the end of it end of what they had there in like 30 minutes they've added a lot more they have a full blown story and everything with it so if you like grounded um that will be out with it and then they're mm-hmm. adding in more content to fallout 76 which i guess they fixed that game i never really played it because the launch was disastrous yeah uh, halo infinite season three will be coming up i don't think a lot of people care about that because <laughs> halo infinite is kind of garbage um, well isn't uh mul- not multiplayer but uh yeah, multiplayer campaign supposed to be coming out. Yeah, they're doing a, be- a beta release of it God. in July and then full release in August. So they'll make sure they have it up and running perfectly probably by the one time the one year anniversary comes around. And unfortunately, like, I need it's to too be late. That game, that game is dead. Like People who... 343, they need to fire their, their staff because they've they've dropped every single Halo release they've had uh, since Halo 4. Yeah. Like, that's the only game that, like... It's coming on this date. They released it on time, and then after that, Master Chief Collection was completely botched and broken for a little over a year. Halo Five was a complete bait and switch with how they advertised it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Halo Infinite, honestly, it does have a decent story. It's just told really shittily, and it completely skips over how it connects to Halo Five. It like literally says, "Oh, all this shit happened after Halo Five, but we're not. You're not going to play any of that." Um, you're going to start playing it from this point. Yeah. And it does explain how we even get there or why what, why you're even where you're at. It's just really fucking stupid. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the next real big game people really care about is the Hogwarts Legacy. Yep, that's coming out um, in November. Yeah, I think it's going to be again the fall because these are the last ones on their list for 2022. Mm-hmm. Oh, and don't forget Microsoft Simulator has the... Uh, uh, oh, the Pelican, Pelican, yeah, the Pelican that you fly around that, and go to space. That they did just add, oh, add like day one, like yeah, like it was the day after the same day that uh, they had their showcase. Like, hey, you can go and download the Pelican, <laughs> which going to our friend college played. It's like, of course it, he did. It doesn't control as you would think, as you think, because I guess when we've controlled Pelicans in Halo, they fly differently. But being in a flight sim, it flies a lot different than you would expect. So he wasn't a, too big of a fan of it. Hogwarts Legacy, I mean, if you're really big into Harry Potter stuff, maybe I have no idea what that storyline is going to be because it's obviously it's not It's before Harry... Harry Potter. It is before Harry Potter? Yes, but, before the events of Harry Potter. But and definitely, before... but after Voldemort. like the Fantastic Beast stuff though, right? I think so. I think it takes place like in the 1800s, if I remember correctly okay. off the top of my head. So yeah, it takes place before the books and the movies. Okay. And then the last one's the Callisto Protocol, which is made by the original studio who did um, Dead Space. That looks really interesting. Um, at least people from that studio left, and they basically... <clears throat> it looks like a more gory Dead Space, honestly. We don't know what the story is or anything like that, but it 
looks like a newer dead space, which is kind of be kind of cool. Um, the big things that they talked about, like they opened the show with Redfall, um, and mentioned Star and mentioned Starfield, but we'll talk about that a little bit because they ended the show with Starfield. Um, but like 2023 is going to start off with Diablo Four, which definitely looks a lot better as long as they don't put the microtransaction BS that they have in their latest release. The was it Diablo Infinite or something? Yep. That which p- plays more like a mobile game. Well, it was designed for mobile, then they released it on mobile and PC at the same time, and it turns out it's like rating, getting like a point two rating now because it's all microtransactions and pay to win bullshit that nobody likes. Um, Redfall is pushed a lot as being a arc- uh, new arcane title, but it's like mm-hmm. one of those titles that basically it seems like they c- didn't feel like they could explain it correctly because it's like. Oh, you can totally play it by yourself and get the and get a cool arcane story out of it, or you can play it with friends. But all the footage they show, like playing with friends, makes it just look like uh, Left for Dead, uh, but with maybe a little bit more uh, strategy thrown in there, mm-hmm. or with some abilities being more uh, strategic. Uh, but even they said, yeah, it looks like a Left for Dead or anything, but it's not. That's not what it feels like when you play it. So we have no idea. What, how that's, that's going to be yeah it's interesting to have like a, a vampire shooter type, a first person shooter and a vampire type story which would be cool mm-hmm. I don't know if that's going to get pulled off right there um, again it's on game pass so we're go- they're going to have a lot of people try it out yeah and then so hopefully with enough players maybe it'll play pretty decently if not we'll find out very quickly and then uh, what there's it's Forza um, again yeah, Force is coming out. Minecraft Legends, which seems like another kind of story thing with Minecraft. Um, Wulong Fantasy, uh, Fallen Dynasty was kind of a new title that they showed. Don't know too much about that. Stalker 2, everybody's been waiting for forever. At least the Stalker fans have. I really don't have an interest in that. Yeah. Flintlock was a brand new IP that they announced, I think, maybe two years ago. Uh, that looked interesting. That's going to be out in 2023. Um, on Game Pass, yep. so that would be um, interesting. And then they have Resident Evil 4 remaster coming out. Yeah, that's what Capcom wanted. Well. Cap- Capcom uh, basically Resident Evil 4 remake, and then they launched uh, Resident Evil 2, 3, 7, and 8, all with next-gen upgrades uh, on uh, basically same day as the presentation. So and if you already have, that, have those games, they should have already taken an update, or they'll take an update to go to next gen um and it will update all the dlc that you've already have with it too plus they announced uh there will be more dlc for fall resident evil 8 which will there be a third person perspective mode for the whole game kind of take for me it would take away from it and especially the horror aspect if you can be third person get more of a view yeah but they're just trying to put it back in the state that like resident evil 2 and 3 are in yeah i understand that but it's yeah, I but like the first person better though. Seven and eight, it's like they're slightly their own thing, while still being Resident Evil a but little bit. They do have the DLC that they're coming out with, which is like called Winter's End or Winter's Fall or something. I forget what mm-hmm. what exactly they're calling it. <laughs> also has an added story DLC, which is only in third person, mm-hmm. where you play as Ethan's daughter Rose as a teenager. Uh, going through something, going through some issues herself with the Resident Evil universe, and then they've added like all the bosses, Elise, um, uh, Lady Dumbastrice, and um, hey, cat. hi, cat. <laughs> uh, what's the guy's name? Harkinsaw or whatever. I forgot. I forgot his name, but the uh. <laughs> the mechanical guy. They basically added them as characters you can play as in mercenaries mode. Hmm. Um, which should be a lot of fun because Mercenary was like kind of a cool arcadey, just uh, shoot 'em up version for Resident Evil, and they're finally going to be releasing the Resident Evil Versus, which was supposed to launch with Resident Evil Eight. They did a short beta of it, and I guess people didn't like the balance or like how it played, and then it basically servers were shut off, and it's not been a workable title uh, since launch, and that I think is finally coming out maybe around June next year. Okay. <clears throat> so almost two years after it was supposed to launch, it might, it's finally coming out. Well, um, hopefully it fixed a lot of this stuff. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, League of Legends is coming to Xbox, uh, which, I mean, League of Legends has been around forever. It's a surprise it took this long for it to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like League of Legends is almost like a World of Warcraft where it runs on everything because it's a massive PC game. Um, but if you're a MOBA fan, great. I don't know how well MOBAs will play on console. I mean, they have uh, Smite, which people still play. Yeah. But I've never cared for I MOBAs. I don't it. like League of Legends. Um, but they have League of Legends, and they have League of Legends Wild Rift, which I think, I guess, is an expansion type of game. Mm-hmm. Uh, they list Valorant here, but I'm pretty sure... I thought Valorant was already on console, um, but maybe it's... Maybe it's just PC only right now. Maybe. I'll have to double-check that again. Um, but one game that looks really interesting that's coming out next year is the last case of Benedict Fox, that Lovecraftian type oh, game yeah. that looked pretty interesting. Uh, side scroller esque. Yep, that did look interesting. Um, and the nice thing is, like, like I said, most of these, even the League of Legends stuff, is all going to be Game Pass. So if you have Game Pass, you get to add, you get to play these games with no additional costs uh, to you until you want to buy them before they fall off Game Pass, basically. And then the biggest title everybody's talking about is Starfield. That was supposed to be the big title for this year. It sucks it's not going to be out by the end of the year, but I mean, at least we get Persona 5 and we get the Callisto Project at the end of 2022. Mm-hmm. If they don't and be Hogwarts. delayed. And Hogwarts. So you'll get at least those games to play this kind of year. Kind big games. Um, but Starfield was one everybody was looking forward to. Because uh, we wanted to get past this so we could finally get the next Elder Scroll game. Which they did confirm that Elder Scroll 6 is in pre-production and they're doing planning on Fallout 5. Which is weird because all the all the sites were picking up, oh, they confirmed Fallout 5. And it's like, they confirmed they started working on it. We always knew it was coming. It's like saying, hey, Fallout 5 is coming in the future. We already knew that. Yeah, we don't um, have an exact date. <laughs> it's not really a news story. Um, the big news was they gave us gameplay footage and final detail and like some more details mm-hmm. of Starfield. The thing that's scaring everybody is I think this is the first time Bethesda has ever mentioned procedural generation, which yeah. is a big oh what what's a uh, big uh oh for everybody because we've seen how it fails or how it gets it makes lazy games like uh, it's because he said that and said there's gonna be a thousand planets in this game that you can visit. People immediately compared it to No Man's Sky, which mm-hmm. No Man's Sky is very reliant on uh, procedural generation uh, of their planets and environments. And we all saw when that game came out, procedural generation gives you a lot of the same shit, but hey, this is a different color. Yeah. Or hey, this is a little bit different, uh, but not super unique. Yeah. And everybody who always brags about how they're going to use that in their game kind of falls flat it on the fall, face. Yeah, it definitely falls flat or doesn't work or it looks like it was a quick way to get something done that doesn't look polished. Mm-hmm. Um, but the funny thing is is that Bethesda's been using procedurally generated content since Oblivion and nobody noticed. Ah. I don't understand. They've explained how it works, but I almost don't understand. It's working on a different level. It's not the same way we understand procedural generation because usually procedural generation is for like No Man's Sky, billions and billions of endless environments to run into because it will just generally uh, procedurally generate these new environments using its whole thing like um i believe uh gearbox's games borderlands use the same thing for their guns yeah that's why there's billions and billions of different types of guns but you also see that that hey these are the guns that all fire the same but they have minor variations on their elements or what they do right yeah so again it's a way to get lots of content, but without a whole lot of effort and not really a whole lot of polished uh, content. Yeah. <clears throat> but apparently, Bethesda has been using it since Oblivion in uh, generating landscapes. So the reason why it seems weird, though, is I can walk through Oblivion, and when you end up around where certain like um, Daedric artifacts are at, those areas are all look the same. They don't look different mm-hmm. it's not like they say they use it to generate the environment so like the trees the grass and all that but like when you go to an area and it generates it you leave you come back it doesn't generate a brand new one so it all looks completely different it looks the same right because i remember walk, going through that and you can i could find like hey this is a landmark i'm almost close to this area I'm almost close to that area versus it looking 100 percent different and you're constantly getting lost because otherwise people would wander the wilderness in like skyrim and oblivion and whatnot and 
be completely lost every time they're off the path because it would you would be think completely it would completely different. It should generate a completely different thing. But apparently how Bethesda has been using it, it's generating stuff, but not in such a way that it's completely lost. It's or more completely controlled. Different. Yeah. So it's definitely unique. It's just this is the first time they've said, hey, we were using using this technique uh, with a game where they've been using it. Um, so a lot of people are freaking out like, oh, okay, are we just going to have a bunch of a 1,000 plants and is 90% of them going to be barren barren plants that we can't do anything with Mm -hmm. where they did admit there's going to be plants that are going to be like ice balls or be completely barren but there'll be plants with stuff on there the only other thing we haven't seen though is alien does alien life exist within this universe because um they said there's a thousand planets but there's only four major cities to go to which Mm -hmm. seems way off as far as like if you're only going to have four major cities that are going to be on planets, then have several different like uh, space stations to visit as well, which we don't know if there's any like space stations. There might visit. be, yeah. They've showed some images of like you can dock with other ships, you can dock with these things. So there might be space stations. There's four major planetary cities, one, and they said one of the cities that they showed us uh, is the biggest city that they've ever built across any of their games. So hopefully there's a lot of density and content in these four cities. And they feel lived in. Yeah. Hopefully that's what we get because otherwise if they don't, it's going to be disappointing. Um, yeah. But it seems like what they've done here is Starfield's taken what Elite Dangerous, uh, uh, No Man's Sky, and all these space games do where like they want to be realistic simulations of, hey, you're flying your spaceship, you fly to a planet, you land, you go do stuff, you take off, you leave, you fly to a, a space station or to a colony you do, and you interact there and you leave. Um, they you cut... build your own base as well. Yeah, they build base building. They have ship building, so you can completely customize your ship, not just on like uh, cosmetics, but you can literally pull modules apart and build it the way you want it to be set up with. You can recruit crew members for your ship, mm-hmm. which I think that sounds very interesting. Uh, whether or not those crew members are like companions or just random NPCs that you can find, like, hey, you're a gunner's mate, cool, come join my ship and, and be my gunner, or be a navigation pilot or something. They didn't really go into depth about how that stuff works, but they said you could do it. Um, the nice thing is that it sounds like what they're doing is they're streamlining the, the process from their, all their other games and kind of what these other games have done in the past. Like Elite Dangerous and No Man's Sky are really fun space sim games, but there's one thing that they both have that's really boring, which is the time it takes to get to anything. Yeah. So you can jump to a solar system, cool, but then you might take five minutes to... Uh, use a pulse drive or something to get to the next planet. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be sitting there. Okay, it's going to take... Elite Dangerous is really bad. Elite, Elite Dangerous can be like, all right, it's going to take 15 it's minutes. Real time, yeah, it's real-time, Yeah, it's real-time, yeah. It's going to take you 10 minutes to fly to a planet or you get to a space station. So you set your course and then you go to your uh, sub-drive and then you basically you get make yourself a drink or something while you wait to get there. No Man's Sky does it faster, but you still have to use a pulse drive, wait till you get there, enter the atmosphere, wait till you get close enough to land. Hopefully there's not clouds blocking so you know where the land's at and you'll fast and do it. And then you got to find a decent place to land or what you might be looking for. What they're going to do in Starfield is there's going to be the space environment where you're in your ship, you're flying around, you'll have like some dog fights, you can dock with other ships, you can steal ships, whatever they do up there. But there's not going to be... Um, you having to fly to land on a planet. They did say you can land on a planet anywhere you want. Like you can land in the mm-hmm. city or you can land outside on the, the outside or somewhere else and explore. But there's not going to be you mainly doing that. It will just go to a cutscene of you landing on the planet, much like what Mass Effect does. Yeah. Which is nice because those areas that everybody like really likes, everybody likes the concept of, oh, look, I'm going from the planet's surface to space. That transition is really nice, right? That transition actually happens a lot faster in No Man's Sky than going from space to land. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot longer to do it. And there's that time that it's taking you to do that stuff kind of gets boring. It eats up um, your the, game time. Yeah, it eats up your game time and it eats up, it takes up some of the enjoyment. So if you can stream on and say, okay, we're just going to skip it. You're going to land he, land wherever you want to land. There's going to cut scene to where you land and you get out and do whatever. And then you get in your ship, you take off. And you go wherever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does a cutscene. You're in space, and you fly wherever. That that'll be fine. Um, what we don't know a whole lot is what all is that are doing in space. What all is that are doing on a planet? There seems to be some varied planet uh, environments. So we've seen cities. We've seen barren planets. We've seen planets with like 
giant crystals jutting out of the ground all over yeah. the place in caves. We've seen alien life that looks really interesting. We haven't seen any foresty type planets. Actually. No, but Either. with a thousand plants, I'd hope there'd be something like that there. Yeah. And, <laughs> and like something wintry. But it sounds like the things that they allow you to do, like if you really want to get into shipbuilding, you can do that or you don't have to do it. If you want to make a base on a, a barren planet or somewhere, or on a, even a popular planet, just set up a base somewhere to do resource gathering, you can. But it doesn't sound like it's something that you have to do. Yeah, which is nice. Whereas like No Man's Sky, they make you do it because they're showing you in a tutorial. You don't have to do it. But you to go through the storyline, you basically have to build something um, as a starter base. Mm -hmm. I don't think they may show you the route to do this in Starfield, but I don't think they're going to make you do it or make you maintain a base. Um, so it's kind of up to you what you want to do. The only thing we don't know is what all is there to do. We do know that there is going to be a main storyline. Which, thank God. <laughs> it's nice. So it means you're, it's going to be like, hey, you got No Man's Sky, which has a storyline that they kind of had to develop as, after the game came out. Um, we're going to have a Bethesda full-blown, here's a storyline. If you just want to take a linear path and play a linear storyline, there's one there for you. And then you can go off and do side quests as you want or say, hey, I'm going to go off and build a base here. Or join this fraction and yeah. do that fraction's storyline. Yeah, so it does seem like we're going to get the Bethesda RPG experience, but just in space. Um, I don't think it's a fair comparison to No Man's Sky because I think it's completely different. Where No Man's mm -hmm. Sky does have a storyline, but it's very varied, kind of varied and like kind of meh and not like really compelling to get into. Where like a Bethesda stories are usually like, hey, there's some urgency to what's going on, so either you care about it and you want to do it, or you can say no, I don't want to do it and go off to your own thing. Yeah, but like if you go off to do your own thing in No Man's Sky right from the get go, you're not going to know how to do and build a lot of stuff until you start following their storyline mm -hmm. where Starfield, maybe you do that for a little bit, but at least the storyline will be compelling. You'll have lots of characters to talk to. And it seems like it'd be something that's going to be like Skyrim where it's going to be so that impacts this universe, universe. that you're in, yeah. uh, not just impact this one little thing. Yeah. And what's nice with the Bethesda is a lot of the main uh, tutorials, it'll happen off in, at the beginning. So that first 30, 45 minutes is just going to be a full tutorial, I bet. Hopefully. Hopefully it'll be that way. And that, that some of the mechanics Actually, that like... That's what it was for uh, the past Elder, Elder Scroll games and Fallout games have been like a tutorial. Like, this is how you shoot. This is how you interact this is how you build up a gun or... yeah but they're gonna i feel like they're gonna have tutorials later on we're like all right now you can build your ship so this is how you build your ship this is how you build your base what i'm hoping they don't do is like fall forward it's like okay you're gonna rebuild this neighborhood all right now you have to rebuild it enough to come back and protect it because it's gonna constantly get attacked. yeah that i hope that That's we don't have <laughs> fucking annoying if i build a a, a space a, a base on a barren planet in the middle of nowhere I don't have to keep coming back to every time a super mutant raid happens or some shit like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like, I just want to come back to it. They go, hey, we have 100% of this stuff. Come get the shit. But they also have to balance it to where, because what they mentioned was like, build a base and do resource gathering. Okay, so if you want to do resource gathering, you can do a lot. So a lot of people do that to break these games so that they can have unlimited wealth or unlimited materials so they can craft whatever they want. You mean what I do in games? I've never seen you build a resource. Well, I don't be built. Well, I don't didn't play the last Fallout because I hated building up a base. Yeah, but I do try to break a game to get the most money out. But of it. they do also let you. All right, so you just want to buy shit, you can buy shit. So there must be enough ways to make money or find items to customize your ship the way you want to without having to build a resource base for it. Yeah, uh, without having to farm for stuff or grind because, like, if you get a point where like. Hey, I need to build this farm so I can resource grind all these things so then I can finally just have enough money to to buy everything or to build everything I want. That gets grindy and boring. Yeah. If I can just play through side quests and gain enough uh, money like you do in Skyrim where eventually you can have well over 100, 100 grand and then literally with the home building stuff or actually before you had it, it was mm -hmm. like once you got married, you would get a stable income just from the random shit that they sold. Yeah. Which luckily they don't sell your stuff in Skyrim. Thank God the <sighs> fucking spouse isn't dumb enough to be like, here, I Here's sold all the shit that you don't use. That you collected and all your Daedric artifacts. I sold all this shit. It's like, yeah. bitch, I'm going to murder you if you did that. But it's 
does sound cool to like be able to build and design your own ship, mm-hmm. be able to, uh, which they also haven't told us how this works, but like literally if you're on a firefight on a planet and the enemy ship lands and they start firing you, you can go wipe them all out, jump in their ship and then take off and steal it. <laughs> how does that work with the crew in your ship? Or like if you can build a fleet or something, maybe. We, we don't know how that's going to work. That'd be cool if you could have a fleet or maybe like a super carrier to carry everything around on. Um, Do you have, just have a giant airspace carrier <laughs> with yeah. everything. That'd be cool if they would give you that. Or at least like, hey, if you're going to build a base, I have a hangar for all the different ships yeah. I've collected. That would be cool. Like, to build your own space station. I think that would be... Yeah, space space. station would be cool if you could build that. Because then that would be, like, an easy port for you to go back to and from. And then that would be a good, like, resource. But again, it's going to... It's also (laughs) going to be weird that it's, like, this is in space. So unlike a Bethesda game where, like, Skyrim, White Room is kind of, like, the central area. If you built stuff around there, you can Mm -hmm. easily get to any part of the map uh, fairly easily without like a huge hassle of going someplace of taking a lot forever to get there. Yeah. And you had your fast travel ways of doing it. Now we're in space. We have a bunch of different, we have a thousand different planets and multiple different systems to go to. What's going to be the central point. That's going to be a good trade point to like jump to everything fairly easily. Cause they did show that you can't just jump directly to wherever you want to go. You have to jump through other star systems to get there. Like most, most space faring games do. Yeah. Keeping it realistic. Let's yeah. see how long they keep that up. Well, I mean, that's the. F- I think cutting out the transition to land on a planet will make that fine because even in No Man's Sky, like you have to transition through other systems to get to destinations like black yeah. holes and stuff. People easily like, all right, I jumped one, I'll jump another one, I'll keep jumping until I run out of fuel. Um, that's usually what, what uh, people do. That's not going to be det- a deterrent. I feel like. Uh, definitely trying to land manually on everything would be a deterrent. I mean, even in Elite Dangerous, they had to implement an autopilot for landing in space stations and landing in places because you could really fuck uh, fuck it up if you weren't good at controlling your ship. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's the big game that's coming out uh, beginning of 2023. <clears throat> um, be out supposedly after Redfall and after Diablo. Um, so we're hoping January, February would be the earliest it uh, lands. And then that should be the game that takes up almost everybody's time until uh, probably some of these old favorites like League of Legends or Resident Evil 4 Persona comes out. Dead Space Remake will be coming out at the end of 2023, mm-hmm. uh, which is one that if you're a big Dead Space fan, that should be that should be pretty cool. Um how it will match up with the Callisto project might make it seem weird. Seem weird. I mean, Callisto's coming out this year, end of this year. That's coming out end of next year. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, Dead Space is a great game. It's cool that they're remaking it, but I'm kind of getting bored of remakes. I mean, I don't need to rebuy the same game over and over. Yeah. And the original Dead Space still holds up. Like it looks great. It's not a poorly graphical game that needs massive updating. They had its own style, and that style is still holding up. Yeah. So it's weird to kind of upgrade games that still look look really good, because mm-hmm. um, they're doing a complete complete remaster on it. Unlike some other games um, that are not necessarily remasters, they're just hey, we're re-releasing it. Yeah, like uh, just making it back back compat. Like the Star Wars uh, old, Knights of the Old Republic too. Yeah, that's that just, needed to be. <laughs> that's literally just kind of like a port to this uh, Switch that they just came out with, and it's not going. It's not a complete remaster. It's just. It's a little hard on the eyes, let's say. Well, they've they've updated enough to where like the textures are sharp and clear where you can play it, but it's like this clearly wasn't remastered, and it's not going to yeah. be remastered like Final Fantasy VII, where hey, we're completely changing the whole story and giving you different, <laughs> just giving you the same characters. In some of the same environments, but we're changing the story completely. It has some of the same beats, sort of. I would say some of it, but like the very, like the most stuff is the same as like the very beginning. Everything else in that game, from what we've played, is like this is not in the original game very much. Like there's a few beats, like the reactor plant in the beginning, the um, whorehouse that he has to he has to do drag in. Um, but everything else is like it's the filler. Mo- it's just filler because the motorcycle stuff is done differently. The storyline is completely different. It's like I just want to remaster Final Fantasy VII. Like, give me Final Fantasy VII with these graphics. I don't need a new Final Fantasy VII story. No, but they have to sell it to you in seventeen parts, all 
six or yeah. eight hour game so they can make that money. Or like how PlayStation's big thing is that oh we're having we're remastering uh Last of Us Part One. It's like why? why? <laughs> Last of Us came on PS3, you've updated it for PS4, so and it looks fine, and you're gonna remaster it for PS5. Like why? It's not an old game, it doesn't need to be remastered graphics, you're not adding anything yeah. to it other than maybe four K and maybe sixty frames a second. Which, yeah, that's great on games, but plenty of people get by without without that, and the game doesn't look bad. It's it's just a money grab at this point. Um, so, gaming definitely looks better in the next 12 months, especially for Xbox, because they have a ton of stuff finally coming out. Uh, it looks like they're getting over the hump that COVID had of blocking a lot of stuff and slowing uh, development down. Mm-hmm. Um, to where we're finally getting the games that we've been wanting uh, to get, that we've heard about, like... Warhammer Dark Tide, Scorn, Atomic Heart, Gotham Knights, Hogwarts, Callisto Project, uh, finally coming out that we've heard about so so long ago. Um, it's great that Persona is finally coming to the Xbox and not just being the spin-off dance games or, or <laughs> fighting games, which nobody wants to play. Um, Persona 5 is definitely a very fun game. I can highly recommend that. Never played Persona 4, but I know that was a really big popular one. Big popular one, one yeah. Uh, Persona 3, like I guess if you're a fan of the franchise, go for it. But it's a PSP game that's like the re- like uh, Nice of the Old Republic 2. It's not a huge remaster. It's just textures have been sharpened, and it can play on the console. So I don't think it's going to... I don't think that game looks very good from what they showed. Yeah. Um, I'm fine with Persona 5. I might try Persona 4, because at least they're all going to be on Game Pass, so it's basically a free game to play. Um, so at least there's something there for everyone who's out there playing games. And if you have game pass, you're going to be able to just access a lot of this stuff for, for uh, for free, basically, mm-hmm. or for your monthly subscription. Instead of having to shell out, uh, 40 to 50 bucks or 40 to 70 bucks for these new titles, which is all, which is the great thing about Xbox. Like it just makes it more affordable to try out different games because you don't have to buy them. Um, that basically covers everything for this week we talked about a couple movies talked a lot about the video games that are coming out uh tell us what uh your thoughts are on those movies if you've seen if you saw unbearable weight of massive talent let us know what you think if you saw jurassic park let us know what you think or jurassic world i mean um and where you thoughts on the games are coming out are there anything you're looking forward to do you know a hell of a lot more about scoring than we do great to let us know i would love to know if that game actually has a story <laughs> if it's just going to be gross uh beautiful graphics um, yeah, because they've done that before with games in the past, and they've they've crashed and burned because of it. Because if you don't have a substance of a story, nobody cares about how pretty it looks. They'll get bored fairly quickly. Yep. Um, but we're excited to hear from you. Let us know in the comments below, um, and be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. And uh, next week we'll talk about the quarry. Oh yeah, the quarry. We'll get in, uh, yeah. We'll spend a whole podcast talking about. The quarry and all the different things you can do, then how it compares to Until Dawn and whatnot. So good. Definitely a good game. You should definitely check it out. Play it. Um, but before we'll go, we spoil it, <laughs> we'll go to more depth and spoilers next week on that. Um, but definitely let us know what you think. Uh, you can always find us at nerdcrusade.com. Um, our, our podcasts, our reviews, all our stories are there. So come check it out. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.